that little bugaboo. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, all right, so should we go to elections? Uh, are we on time? Is it 2.30 that we were supposed to start this? Exactly. It is, okay. Madam Chair. Right, so we'll start with whoever's here. Um, so I, um, we had four things that we didn't get to yesterday. One is the write-ins, there's Will, good. One is um, the report to the totals at the close of polls. Um, one is voter ID required, multi-party observers and same day registrate, or registration, get the same people who register and vote on the same day get a provisional ballot. Those are the four under the town clerks that we didn't get to. And then we'll move on to um, uh, the candidates category. Okay. Yep. Is everybody okay with that? Yep. Okay. And I apologize to Senator Collimore because I sent him the biographical data of all the um, people from the 20, 1920 um, legislative session or 18, 19 or whatever that was, instead of his title 17. So as he's thumbing through his book, you know that he's trying to figure out who the House members were. Well, and the nice thing about that book is it actually had date, a lot of information about us, which if you look at the current one, has almost nothing because we've taken out so much information. I mean, you know, just- Like our birth dates? Yeah, and more. I mean, it, it, people's addresses aren't there anymore. I mean, it's like uh, there's a bunch of stuff that's not included anymore. Yeah, I know. I agree with you. So uh, let's go <coughs> to the issue of the write-ins. And we, I believe, have had that on our request from town clerks for probably 10 years. And the issue is the town clerks don't want to have to count. Well, Carol, why don't you set the scene for us and tell us how many you had that you had to count that weren't Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, which you don't have to count anyway. So do you want to talk to us about the, this issue? Yes, um, except let me just pull up my document that's got my some data in it. Um, the, uh, oh gosh, that's way too small to read. <laughs> that's better. Um, yeah, the, the law calls for us to um, tally all write-ins and, mm -hmm. um, and we certainly understand the, the reason behind it. Um, write-in candidates are, uh, you know, it's, we have all seen write-ins get elected um, and so we, we understand the, the need, but, but we also see every year um, the, the significant uh, number of um, essentially joke write-ins um, that, uh, or one-offs, um, you know, that, that don't have any impact um, and are, uh, you know, take time, not only to, for election workers to tally, but for reporting. Um, it, it's, whoops. Um, it's particularly um, uh, pervasive in uh, primary, the primary elections, uh, because we have a lot of people who want to, uh, they, they, uh, they don't like the idea of being forced to vote just one party ballot. And so they write candidates from the other ballots on the one ballot that they have been given. Um, and so we'll end up with, you know, tens or hundreds of write-in ballots, you know, as an example, on the Democratic ballot for Governor Scott. Um, and so those, and that it's not a, a Republican vote for 
Governor Scott. It's a vote for Phil Scott to be the Democratic candidate for governor. Um, and voters don't understand that. Uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to explain that to them. But, but that leads to uh, a lot of um, uh, write-ins. Um, we also, just on the local level, um, at town meeting last year, I had 67 write-ins. Um, none of them were actual candidates, nor did any of them receive enough votes to qualify to be elected. Um, I've had people come up to me after they finished voting and go, I wrote you in for everything. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, so then I end up with, um, you know, but we have to tally them all and, and, and report them. Um, so one of the, what we've talked about, as you said, Madam Chair, um, a, a number of times over the years is coming up with a way for write-in candidates to declare their candidacy. Um, on the state level, that could be done through the Secretary of State's office. It could be done as late as the day before the election. Um, and then the Secretary of State could send word out to all the clerks as to which candidates would need to be, who are the legitimate write-in candidates that would need to be tallied. For local elections, it could be done to the clerk before close of polls. So it could be that we have a stack of consent to candidate forms at our, at our polling place and, um, you know, Jane Smith comes up and says, yep, I've decided to run a write-in campaign for our school board and she signs the form and now we make sure to count the write-in votes for Jane Smith for school board. Um, one of the reasons that this is important is that without knowing which Jane Smith is the candidate, we could have multiple Jane Smiths in our town and have 47 write-in votes for Jane Smith, and we don't know which one um, it's for. So this would certainly help solve that problem. Um. <clears throat> Any questions for Carol? I have I have one but committee. So so my question is here is um, when you were talking about I hadn't even thought about it in terms of the primary, but I for example have a couple times I I run in the Democratic primary, but I have a couple times gotten enough votes on the Republican primary. Um, ballot to be an official candidate in, to run as a DR if I wanted to, and then I accept that or don't accept it. But that, if, that would eliminate that possibility for anybody to get a, to be, become a candidate for in a, um, another party. Is that right? I, I would imagine, yes, it would. Okay. Allison, Senator Clarkson. I, I think I think that's good. I, I think I think that uh, I think your idea, Carol, is a good one. It shows intentionality. It show you know it means that that people have committed in some basic way to saying to owning uh, their spot, their their right in candidacy. And I, I I think that's great. And I I have long thought that people running uh, in in both. And, and I mean, I've always thought that was a problem, what Jeanette just described. So I think that uh, I actually think this is a, a, a great idea. And it really shows as people own own that they want to actually be considered uh, as a candidate for that job. This would mean that somebody couldn't run in the general election as an, a DP. They wouldn't they couldn't do that. Or a well, DR or an RD, they wouldn't have any ability to do that. Senator Polina, did you have, oh no, that, oh yes, no, that is your Well, hand. I did my hand, it's kind of, I look really dark in the picture. I'm looking at myself and I can barely see myself, but it's We me. thought you were in the witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I look so dark, but anyway, I, what you just said is not exactly true, I don't think, because um, you could run in, let's say the Democratic primary, win the primary, <laughs> And then be nominated by the Republican Party or the Progressive Party. You could be write. nominated, yeah. So you know, right. it doesn't always happen to write off, so, write in. So I'm saying, right. And I think having not a lot. I think that 
I differ with Senator um, Clarkson. I think that it takes away the ability of people to do something that's kind of spontaneous in a way. They, they want to show their support for uh, for Jeanette White in the Republican primary because they're Republicans, but they support her and they should have the ability to do that. I just think it sort of squashes their ability to express themselves. I think there's some legitimacy maybe to saying there's a way of notify people on the day of the election. That might be worth talking about, but you don't always know that people are writing you in. Senator Colmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I sympathize with Carol and I, I'm hoping for some middle ground and I'm hoping uh, Will Senning might be able to offer some suggestions. I certainly see a difference between somebody writing in Mickey Mouse um, and someone's name that actually lives in the community. And I don't know how to filter that, I admit that, but I think it's fairly clear when someone's making, as Carol said, a, a joke out of it. And I, I don't know how to do both. So I guess I'm, I'm agreeing with Senator Polina. I think it still should be available to people even at, on the election day itself. You know, someone would have a last minute campaign put together quickly and actually be able to win. Um, but anyway, I, I'm waiting to hear what Will might suggest. Good, I, I will comment here that they don't have to count Mickey Mouse. If it's a fictional right. character, if it's nominating the the tree or whatever, they don't count those. They only count real people. Will? Do you Just a couple of points to make while you guys are discussing it. It's a good discussion. Um, keep in mind that what we're talking about is the reporting requirement. Obviously, anybody's still going to be able to write in whoever they want to write in and express themselves that way. You're not going to be saying you can't write this name down. What you're talking about is which names the clerk has to account for on the official right. return of vote and list a name. That also, of course, and I think any legislation should be clear about this, that only a declared write-in candidate could win or else we'd have to figure out some language that if a certain individual, one that hadn't been declared, received a certain number of votes that they then got reported, I think that gets messy. I think the point should be you have to be declared to have your votes reported and to win. Um, I wanted to make the point that Senator Polina made that those dual party nominations come from various sources, including the committee nominations. So that would still be able to happen. And then Senator White, to go back to your first comment, you could craft the language in such a way that says a candidate on one primary ballot can declare as a write-in candidate. And you could each year declare as a write-in candidate for the other two parties. There is clear law right now that your name can't be listed on two separate primary ballots. Right. You can file for those. But you guys could carve out an exception that said, however, a candidate on one primary ballot can register as a write-in candidate in the other parties. That would be up to the committee. Um, otherwise, I think in general, Carol pointed out correctly that this is primarily a problem in the primary. And keep in mind that a big reason it is is just because there's so many empty races, too. So there's no candidate to vote for. So the only thing you can do is write someone in if you want to vote. Um, and that in the primary causes these really massive lists of um, names that the clerks have to report uh, after the election. And so I think you could consider a bill or a, a provision too that just did this for the primary election and not the general. John. Um, I'm gonna be the outlier among the clerks here. Uh, first of all, I, I, if we're reviewing every ballot anyway, I don't think it's an extraordinary amount more work, but just in general, the idea of changing the write-in process uh, to essentially just another filing paperwork requirement. So you've got two tiers of candidates with different filing uh, uh, requirements, and then add on to that that, yes, you could write anybody in, but it wouldn't actually mean anything because it wouldn't be reported. It would be as much of a vote as, you know, putting a lawn sign out in front of City Hall. I think when you have challenges, I, I just think the principle of rolling back even a tiny, tiny bit, the democratic participation process, I'm all for adding them on. I'm not for rolling any back. 
and even even a tiny bit just as a matter of principle and i think that's that's what th this kind of thing would have the effect of doing so i actually agree with john i've and as carol knows i've i've objected to this measure probably 10 times and um i i think that it it does stifle people's ability to vote for whom they want to vote and i mean it doesn't they can still do it but there's no chance that that person could be elected so what happens in the case of a a, a week before the election some really horrible news comes out about a, a candidate and people say oh my god this is really terrible i can't vote for that person but there's no one really running against them or they people don't like the person that's running against them so we're going to we're going to write in so and so they they should be able to do that from as a as a um, an activist, not not the person themselves wanting to do it and declaring, but from the community itself wanting to support some person, and they should be allowed to to win and to hold that office if they they win. I believe so. I I know that I'm probably an outlier on the committee here, as John is with the town clerks, but um, that I I have always thought that this, and actually I will say that we had this in, um, we did, I was convinced one year to put it into the bill that we did on election reform and it was taken out on the floor of the Senate because they objected to um, the stifling the will of the voters. Just to let you know that, that that happened. Will? I was going to ask actually Carol if she could refresh my memory or you might be able to, Senator White, have past iterations of this suggested maybe, and I would throw this out there, whether it only applied to statewide offices? Yeah, the, I, the I, version, I, yeah. I think so. Yeah. And that answers a lot of the questions about the dual nominations across parties for all your reps and senators still being able to be written in. It also the more I think about if we were to do it for for the legislature as well, that would be a lot of filings for my office to manage at one time. And we may route those through the rep district clerks or the Senate district clerks being the folks you need to file with for to declare for those offices. If we could start with the simple step of statewide filing with the Secretary of State's office. And if it were just those, that's a manageable amount for us. Again, just to reiterate, reiterate what Carol said, we could do it the day before, Senator White, which would address some of your concern about yeah, no. changes in circumstance, um, which I understand too. Well, yeah, I, I was thinking of it more um, as the, the argument on the Senate floor was that it stifles the will of the voter, not the will of the candidates, but the will of the voter. And that we, we need to make voting, make people's voices, count when they're they're voting and if their voice isn't counted then we've stifled the will of the voter that's that was the argument and i'm just throwing that out for what it's worth so what you're saying is that we should um not have to count them for presidential and statewide people but count for every other office is that what you said will that was what I suggested. I, I, I'd okay. be curious if Carol thinks that's a meaningful step forward. And I see Alice. I can, Alex. I can ahead, see Carol. certainly for for the the primaries that it would that it would be significant. I think so too. Senator Clarkson. So just yesterday, everybody was arguing about. Everybody knows the rules. They know the deadlines. They ought to be able to live by them. And today we're being not consistent with that. And I, I would say that if, if, if you are, are wanting to represent a city or a community or a county, um, that, 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 or even be the, um, the uh, trustee of public funds, 
I, I think intentionality and owning the fact that you would like to have that office and you feel qualified for that office is important. I, I don't know why, but I, I think that's an important piece of this. And um, so I, mean, I, I, I guess um, I, I, uh, I, I hear you on the, the, the voice of the people, but also I, I think we have a time frame and we have, we have a, you know, and everybody knows it's all publicized. And if we allow for people to let their clerks know that they are writing as uh, running as a write-in candidate up till the day before, I think that is a, a fair thing. It is. It wasn't the will of the candidate. It wasn't the candidates knowing. It was the, if you have a groundswell of people in a community that want to elect somebody, right? that person may not even know. Yeah, but then why? I mean, they, maybe they don't want it. I want maybe my candidates to want the positions they're elected to. I know, I know. I just... I mean, I'm, I really have a problem with people just randomly... Uh, 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 elect, I mean, and I don't know if this has even ever happened. I'm sure it's happened because it's Vermont. So I'm sure what, something's happened like this. <laughs> but but um, I, I, I think it's as important for somebody to want that job and be willing to accept it and do the work of that job as it is for the people to say, and they have plenty of time to say that before the day before. I mean, they have, I, 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 yeah, you know. I get it. I get it. I get it. I saw Senator Collimore had a, his hand well, up. Yes, Madam Chair, and you made the point I was going to make. Um, so I think you have successfully talked me into supporting your position. I, I can see a situation, Senator Clarkson, where the day before or two days before an election, something happens. I don't know what it could be. It could be a very bad thing that happens to a potential candidate or <clears throat> something in the community that changes the landscape and so you have this groundswell of support all of a sudden that says you know what I'm not voting for x I'm going to go vote for y and I'm going to call everybody I know and see whether we can get that to happen the candidate not doesn't necessarily have any idea that this is happening but I think we we at least should allow that eventuality to happen if indeed it did and the candidate if if he or she won could always say it I'm not interested. I, I, I don't accept. I mean, that's not to me. I, I think it's more important to, to leave room for the voters wishes than the candidates. S Senator Rom, you haven't weighed in at all. Or I saw <laughs> Senator Polina's hand up. Yeah, too. Polina's hand is up. Yeah, well, I'll give you brief. I, I agree with what Senator Collimore just said and, and what Janet, what you said, Madam Chair, as well. I think that it's up to the voters. The voters need to be given that choice. So I, I, I would I would agree back to going back to John Odom's statement, which I think was also pretty strong. So I, I would agree that my position would be to leave it alone. I, I, I mean, I was just I was just thinking about, you know, we we have a we have a House member, Representative Hal Colston from Winooski, who started as a write-in candidate against someone on the ballot in Winooski for city council. You know, there's, it's just, it, it does happen that people decide after certain deadlines that they. Well, he actually ran as a write-in candidate. In these yeah, cases. He did it like three times he ran as a write-in right. candidate. <laughs> but yeah, you know, his, exactly. his, his yeah, first race was, you know, as a write-in candidate. In, in, these, in, these, in the cases that we're talking about, people don't declare they're a write-in candidate. Right. No, they just Hal, get, wa they Hal just, wanted that job. Right, Hal, they just Hal get wanted elected. that job and ran, yes. ran a race mm -hmm. to be a writer. Yeah. But I guess it's hard to distinguish between someone, if, if other people sort of come to that person and say, we really want you to run, and they say, great, I'll, I will serve, you know, where's the line between sort of saying that, yes, I, I would like to serve and just not making a public statement about your intention, I guess. Like, are you saying that if someone says, no, I really don't want to serve, please don't put me in the ballot. There's a different- No, no, th what this is saying is that it, uh, unless the person has declared mm -hmm. as a candidate, there the votes for them will not be counted. But then, so declaring 
is declare is filing your petition pa your papers. Oh, right. So or, this, or as Carol suggested, for local elections, declaring yeah. the day before. Right. Or the day of. Or the day, right, whatever. But you and, have to declare. That's and, the, and, that's the issue here. And, declare physically in the clerk's office, like put in paperwork. You have to officially declare. John wants to say something. John, I know, yeah. Oh, you know what I always, I, the conversation I get in so much about term limits is that I am against term limits because it's my vote and I should get to vote for whoever I want. Um, I, I think the argument stands here and it's not just about physically writing in because if it doesn't count, that's not a vote, that's graffiti. Um, but. I think I have a right to vote for who I want and it should matter. So I guess the um, question is, do we wanna address this at all for any of them? And I, I, I know that it's a problem with the um, primaries because of the way we do the primaries, but maybe when we get to the primary issue, we can solve that issue. Although, I guess maybe not. Anyway, so where are we, committee? Here, poor Carol. <laughs> it's not something I'm going to fall on my sword over. That's for sure. <laughs> there, there are bigger fish to fry. <laughs> I, I, agreed. I'm with Carol. <laughs> I would vote to just leave it alone. Okay. Well, I would agree. Okay. What about, but I thought Will and Carol were also asking us to think about the statewides and the. Yeah. They were, but the, I think the three of us think that we should just leave it alone because if, if John is correct, it's his vote. He should be able to vote who he wants to vote for, whether it's in a local or a statewide or a Senate district. I really trust the voters on this one. You know, after, after the South End primary, the, some of the candidates who, who are now our legislators from Burlington South End were very nervous. And I said, honestly, even if Howard Dean decided he wanted to run after the primary, he probably wouldn't win because they the voters have really sort of decided who won the primary and who they want. I think people use this in very specific cases. Sometimes something egregious happens to the candidate on the ballot. The person who people pick might not want to sort of say that they are running and that they don't necessarily want to sort of pile on to the person who doesn't look like the candidate of choice anymore, but they don't want to kind of be make that intentional or clear. I, I just think voters are pretty good at determining what they want out of this situation if there's a if there's a write-in candidate to be had. And that many people aggregating their perspective is a big deal, which was the case in Hal's election in Winooski, which is very rare to have happen. Okay, so I'm going to, unless there's more to say, I'm going to move on to the next issue. Anybody? The sun is in my eyes here, so you have to yell if you can, um, if you, because I'm having a hard time seeing my screen. Um, okay, so I don't, the next one that was on our list is report the totals at the close of polls, that we do that anyway, right? I didn't. Will? What's the exact language, Senator White? Sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Oh, it was on the list. Um, yeah, I'll call it up. Sorry. It just said report the totals at the close of polls. Well, actually, it, it says report total number of votes cast at end of day. Yeah. Oh, yes, that yes. Total votes cast. I think this is connected to the postmark and accepting votes afterwards. I think they kind of were all connected i do not know what that's referring to senator Wayne. okay Sorry. but we do we do at the end of the day at the end of the day they they report how many votes are cast right yes okay. I, maybe it's maybe it's referring to during early processing is that is that the thought how many might have no. been processed no okay. so okay well we're going to move on from that unless we hear from other somebody else so voter ID required, I'm gonna go there. 
And um, we do not, Will, do you want to tell us what we currently require and when we require it? Uh, sure. We only require form of ID to be submitted to the clerk if you are registering for the first time in Vermont by mail or online. Once you're registered in Vermont, you don't have to show ID to either vote in person at the polls or to request or submit an absentee ballot. And if you're registering for the first time in person at your town clerk's office, you don't have to show ID? Cool. Okay, does anybody have um, want to speak to this? Senator Colomar? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. How did you know I, I would want to? Because <laughs> uh, you put, you unmuted yourself. Okay, all right, that's good. Um, yeah, I, it's probably a weak analogy, but I, I would feel sort of like the, uh, a little kid with my finger in the dike. So I, I don't think I could convince the rest of the committee that uh, to support this, but I, I would support at least the first time you register to show some form of identification. I thought we did. I'm, I, I, when Will said that, I was surprised. I could see not going to the polls. I know that's probably never going to be um, something that Vermont does, but that's all. So I, I also did think that the first time you registered to vote, at, if you did it at the town clerk's office, that you showed your driver's license or, or something. No, I guess no. not. And the, I mean, the, I'll just say as someone who's registered, you know, hundreds of voters at the door, I give them the oath, I give them their pink form, and I take forms to the clerk's office. Yep. Right. Yeah, I, I do that too. But I thought yeah. when they do that, that they were showing me their well, driver's they, license. They all they often are. I mean, I, I ask They're for their driver's you license because you have to you have to write it down. And so the driver's license in full is an ID and it's on their voter registration. So I- Or their I social security it. number. We all met, register masses of voters. So that is pretty standard. The only thing where they their full identity is not done is when they only have their last four digits of their social security. But uh, mostly people do their, you know, generally uh, people show me their driver's license. And don't we write that down when we register yes. people? There's a for, there's a place there where you register where you write down their driver's license. A absolutely, but you, that's that's great. So you have a form of ID when you register them, that, which is but, I think our point. But the the one where you don't have the same uh, amount of identification is when they just use the last four digits of their social security, and then it's incumbent on the Secretary of State's office or the clerk's <laughs> office to double check that. But Will is telling us that if you go to the town clerk's office and register, you don't show your driver's license or your social security number. You don't put that in. Is that yeah, right? You do you have to put it on the form? No, you don't, not, yes, if you you're, both, the, you're both right. You don't have to show it and produce it. Right. You have to right. write the number on the form oh. in the space provided. Yeah, yeah. right. We're but, talking so, about but, producing ID is, is my understanding. So how much follow-up do the clerks do actually on checking up the, the, the social security, the last four digits work and the driver's license is legit? It's one very nice element of our new election management system that we implemented in 2015. We get the nightly file of all DMV customers every night. And so any new registrations and new DL numbers that are pumped into the system are pinged off of that file and verified. So they're either verified or not. Same thing with the social security administration that happens less frequently. It's every couple weeks that we ping the SSN people. There's only one person there who's allowed to do that, which is interesting. Um, so those numbers are verified. Just a little more nuance. The way I've always understood the first time registrant by mail or online requirement is that idea is being provided essentially to show that they are the person who they say they are. I'm always careful to distinguish this with the clerks. It's not a proof of residency thing. 
So for instance, it doesn't have to be your Vermont driver's license. People who haven't gotten one yet can show the one from the state they're coming from. So to me, that's really a, it's a check on like whole scale fraud of some automated service of sending in forms with just random numbers on them. It's, it's to say, okay, you're the person, the name you put is who you are and giving a little more personality to that application when it comes in the mail. For instance, what Senator Rahm was describing, there's a um, exception for forms collected through a voter registration drive because those are collected in person by a human who's seeing that there's a human handing them that form and signing under the penalties of perjury that they are who they say they are. Um, so then you can bring a stack of forms to the clerk and say, these are from a voter registration drive that was conducted by us in person and there's no ID required to be submitted with those. And Senator White, as you know, we had a very long debate about this four years mm -hmm. ago, I believe, um, yeah. in both houses. Mm -hmm. well, Not to say it can't be debated again, of course. But. Well, unless there's um, more um, appetite for doing this, um, I think Senator Collimore might be right that he's facing an uphill battle on this one, unless I hear from other people, we'll move on to another one. So um, uh, committee members. Thank you for your understanding. Senator Polina. It's one of those things where I would ask what's, what's the problem we're trying to solve? So I, I would leave it alone. Okay. Senator Clarkson. I am good with how we are. Senator Rahm. I just I appreciate Senator Collamore's you know acknowledgement even if he, he feels passionately about the issues so just appreciating that noted. All uh, right, thank here, you, here. Senator Collamore. Here, here. I, well, I I was outvoted four to one the last one, Brian. So you know it's we're, 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 uh, Senator Clark, don't, don't, please don't think for an instant that I didn't enjoy that brief moment. Yeah, yeah, I bet you do. I am not enjoying your moment quite as much. Thank okay. Um, the next one on the list is um, authorizing multi-party observers at the polls. And I thought we already did that. Um, Carol can, or John, can you address that? If we allow... Them yes, the, um, with regards to poll watchers, um, yes. they, they can have um, two poll watchers per party or per candidate. Um, and I, I, so I, I'm not sure what exactly this might be referring to. So the, um, each party could have two, two poll watchers at each poll. And each candidate could also have two if they wanted to. Okay. Is this this is currently allowable? Yes. Yeah. How, okay. How often is that requested? Very rarely. I think it was more of an issue in this last election. We it's yeah, not. and we just an interesting note. We included a provision in one of our directives this year that anybody wanting to engage in that activity this year should, should file with the clerk first. It was in an effort just to give a heads up of numbers of people that would be in polling places in terms of COVID capacity. And I wasn't aware of a single filing. So it does it sounds like it's not really even an issue. No, it's important, I think, to have in the law and on the books if, if people want to do that. But I'm not sure why. And it's certainly open to all parties. OK. So, but it isn't on the books now. It is. So we don't need to, okay, all mm -hmm. right. So <clears throat> the next one is same day registers. People who register and vote on the same day get a provisional ballot instead of a regular ballot. So does somebody wanna speak to that? That is currently they just get a regular ballot and it isn't provisional, am I right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, is there anybody? Oh, Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's just a clarifying question. Um, 
and Carol or John could probably weigh in. How how many people, if if this were to go through and they get a provisional ballot, I'm assuming there would be an added step for you folks later on to because you've got to separate it right at, at, at some point and then put them together again. So how many people are we talking about that normally come in the, the very day of election and take advantage of that? Well, for, for the November election, particularly in a presidential year, that's always when it's the highest. Um, we had close to 100 through the course of the day. 100 out of how many people voted in your ward? Just under 4,000. So it's not a lot. We've broken 100, too. And are you about 4,000 total as well, John? In terms of what we reported this last time, it was more like 45, 46. Hmm. I guess I don't know how I feel about this. Could I just... Well, <laughs> Senator Polina? I'm just curious. I mean, I know what a provisional ballot means, but what does it kind of look like? Is it, I mean, I walk in and I... I get a provisional ballot. Is it like scarlet red or something? And <laughs> you put it aside in a certain while. Well, I'm just wondering like what, what happens to it? Is, is the stigma attached to it? More work attached to it? Like what, what happens to it? Provisional when you ballot. get your little um, I voted sticker. It, it says maybe. It, yeah. <laughs> so there's a question mark in front of the I voted. Uh, I thought all same day voters got provisional ballots. They get they regular. Get, they get regular ballots. Okay. I don't know why I thought that. I thought somebody said that the other day, which surprised me. So does does anybody want to go here and require that they be no. kept separate? No. 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 Okay. All right. So we're done with town clerks list. I mean, not we're not done with the town clerks, clearly. Can we move on to um, candidates? I don't, I, and I have no idea what time it is. It's maybe it's 3.15. Would it be a Can good moment take a to break? go and, yes, a good, good idea. Uh, and, and well, when we take a break, we are now, um, everybody put their mute and their camera off and Gail will put up a sign that says um, we're on a break and she will also discontinue um, the live stream until yes. we come back. Right. Okay. Um, John Odom might have had something on oh. this topic, but I just want to. Oh, John, I'm sorry. Oh, just mention a couple things, do my due diligence. My concerns about the um, tight filing deadlines for town meeting didn't make it on the list. I realized no, we're, that. Yes. Oh, they it did? Is. It's oh. under elections. Oh, okay. It's under well, general election. Never mind that. And just the other thing that I'm doing my due diligence as an elected clerk in Montpelier, I uh, again, because I didn't quite see the logic for it, would stress that we in Montpelier would really like the ability to send out mail ballots and to have that ability extended to schools and other municipalities because otherwise it will be impossible and impractical for us. And I'm not sure of the reasoning behind not allowing. Well, I think that what we will do is we will look at that when we look at the issue of, um, uh, we have it here under coordinate the town and school elections and the timing of, <clears throat> under primaries, we have the, the timing of local ballots. So we have kind of it. And John, when you raise your hand, raise your Right hand. Uh oh. Yeah, because then we can see hand, it a little bit more easily. I'm right handed. Hand, I don't know why I'm doing this. That's well, your well, left it, hand is in front of the window. I mean, so I can't see it. I'll do this. Okay. Oh, that, yeah. oh, that's much better. Okay. All right. We'll be back in 10 minutes. So um, the, we're moving on to the. Um, list under candidates. And the first one on there is um, requiring a potential candidate to have voted in all elections for which they're eligible. I'm going to not go there today because I want um, 
Ella Spotswood from the AG's office could not join us today. And she's the, well, she's the campaign finance guru over there, but um, they couldn't join us today. So we're it, gonna it, put that. Yeah, if I may, Madam Chair, when they come and I could email Ella directly if it's helpful. I, one of the things I wanted to know from them are, is kind of the pros and cons of waiting until this goes to court. Um, well, yeah. I think we should have that discussion. Yeah, yeah. In With her. Right, yeah, no, I, I just meant que queuing her up to be prepared to have that conversation. Like, are there pros and cons to, to let I've, it happen in court instead of? In the I've life? already done that. Okay. Yeah, I think our chair's the. Okay, I was just. That's the tee up. Yeah, I, I mean, I have contacted her and told her what the issue is and um, why, why we are taking it up. Um, okay, so the next then is the deadlines for independent and minor party candidates. So Will, do you wanna tell us where that is right now? Sure. I'm not sure where this came from, Senator White, although I think you said it came from our office. You know, I, I don't know, but it's a question that's on here. And so we should address. Yeah. It. I, I want to check with Secretary Condos about this issue because I know he's mentioned it, but I'm not entirely clear what um, his concern with the deadlines is right now. From an administrative perspective, on my end, I think they're okay. Um, it's set up right now that we get those so <laughs> independent and minor party candidates, which that you just asked about, only run in the general election. So you populate the general election ballot through minor party nominations, independent candidate petition filings, and then winners of the major party <coughs> primaries. Those three things all come together to get your list of candidates for the general election. And right now we get the independent candidates the Friday before the primary. And you all have had significant debate about that in the past, about whether they should could be allowed to file after the primary, primary or not. That's the sore loser debate. Right now, that's that's not an option because they have to decide and file as an independent before they know whether or not they won the primary. Although you can still still do that, and then you withdraw your independent candidate nomination if you win your primary, or keep your independent candidate nomination if you lose your primary. Right now, though, those are due the Friday before, and so we've got those in house. Then you get the the primary winners on the Tuesday of the primary. And then the Friday after the primary is when the um, minor party nominations are due. So from my perspective of ballot creation, that's really helpful because we have all the information we need for the ballot by the Friday after the primary. Um, that's also when your choice of parties are due. So if you get nominated by more than one of those means, you tell my office by that Friday which nominations you accept and in what order you want them to appear on the general ballot. Okay, so I'm gonna um, open it up to questions and comments, but first I'm going to tell you where I stand on this. And I know this is a losing battle. I do not think independents should have to declare their candidacy until after the primary. And it isn't just the sore loser issue. Somebody may decide after the um, primary that they don't like any of the three party candidates. They, they don't think that they are gonna represent the, the district or the, the, at all. <clears throat> and so they decide to run, they have no ability to, to do that. So I, I'm, and I know that as <laughs> Senator Collimore said, it's an uphill battle on the issue that he brought up. I know this is an uphill battle for me here, but I, I honestly don't think they should be declaring their candidacy before the primary is over. So anybody want to weigh in on this or where we are? Um, well, Senator Clarkson? I'll just jump in and because given it's been that kind of a day. 
uh, I, I would actually support the position we came to agreement on, except for you, uh, uh, two years ago. I think it's important for independents to declare, uh, and I think it's important for them to, again, uh, own their candidacy before the primary. Anybody else? Senator Polina? I guess I would, I mean, I, I guess I would ask what the downside is of letting people announce after the primary. I don't know. I know you don't, I know you don't have a good answer to that tonight, I understand, but. Does somebody have a, have a good reason for not allowing them to declare after the primary? If the, the parties, <laughs> the parties themselves can, if, if the, Democrats don't run somebody in the primary. They have until, I believe, the Friday after to, to nominate somebody. So if they can nominate somebody a week after the election, why couldn't the independents also nominate themselves? Can I, can I just clarify? Are we, mm -hmm. if, you ran, if you ran in the primary and you lost, are you still allowed to run? Is an independent in that? Correct. You, That's you currently. Currently, no, you no. would have to declare your independent um, petition the Friday before, so you wouldn't know if you've lost or not. And the, okay. um, but and the way I see this is, um, if you lose, you should be able to declare as an independent. But it isn't just if you lose; somebody may not have run in a primary at all. <laughs> and right. then they just, yeah, but so you are allowed to, but only if you declare your independent um, uh, candidacy the um, the Friday before the election. Right. So, what does somebody want to answer? And the Senator Polina's question about what is the downside to allowing independents as opposed to party people? and minor party people to run afterwards. Allison? Well, I mean, first of all, they in the primary have, in this situation, have asked to be considered in a party and have used the party's primary slot, or, you know, that spot as a, as a way to run. And then if they lose that, it does, you know, that they've lost it. So I, I don't think they should get a second bite at the apple. I don't think that's fair. And I don't, uh, I think if the party has an open slot a week later and wants to nominate somebody in that, you know, it, it would be obviously a little different, but I think that 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 is absolutely fair. The party has vetted them. There's a body who have vetted a, a, a candidate. I think letting people run who've lost uh, what, it's like using, it's using the, I can't get over feeling like it's using a system and then disregarding it all together. Uh, but if the person didn't run in the primary, but after the primary was over, they said, you know, I don't like the Republican, I don't like the Democrat, and I don't like the progressive because none of them represent my community. Oh, well, then they can do a write-in candidacy. <laughs> We've just they, allowed that. But they can't declare their candidacy on the Could they someone can't. help me <laughs> so so the yeah. change is that right now they have to announce before the primary the friday before the tuesday primary yes. that they intend to run as an independent after the primary regardless of the outcome they, they can't have to do that they wouldn't be i mean they wouldn't be able to then take the i if they had won a primary no, they could they could take either one at that point I mean, if they if they won the primary for the Democrats, but then they also filed as a as an I before, they could choose either one to run on the general ballot, right? Is that right, Will? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, Senator White? They could. I was looking at the statute to make sure I've got this stuff right, and I need to correct myself on something. But if if they if they win the Democratic primary and also file as an independent because they were afraid they might lose that, they then can either say, I've decided I'm gonna run as independent 
or as a Democrat. They can choose either one at that point. Correct, but not both. Yeah. Right. Right. But but then could they the Democrats not then fill in because then they would have an open hole with no candidate. They could then uh, uh, fill in that open slot. Right. Yes. By nominating so, somebody. <clears throat> right. So if somebody can clarify for me why it's okay for the parties to be able to have a week after the primary to nominate somebody, but a, an independent can't nominate themselves after the primary. That's the, que that's the question that I have. I... Well, yeah. It's so nobody, <clears throat> yes, yeah, Will, I go, Will, go for it. I, well, I need to correct, correct myself from previous. Um, this is a real test, by the way, to be jumping through these election issues one by one and having a lot at the top of my head, but I appreciate it. I know. It. Um, the minor party committee nominations are due prior to the primary. Minor parties need to file on the Thursday before. Oh, I thought they were the Friday after. I'm sorry. The, the, that deadline that I was thinking about is for the major parties right. that fail to nominate via the primary. And they actually have six days after the primary to do that. And the reason for that six days is so that they can, there's a five day notice on um, committee meeting hearings, committee meetings. So they can put out their five day notice and on the sixth day nominate for any offices that they failed to elect through the primary. And then what Senator Clarkson was referring to too, candidates can withdraw right at any time up to the printing of the ballot really is the language in the statute. And then I would have to look back, but it's either seven or 10 days, Bruce may know that, uh, that the party has to nominate somebody to fill in any withdrawal or death of a candidate. Bruce, do you know? I think it's 10. Uh, Bruce Olson, Vermont Democratic Party. I do not know the exact number off the hand. I would have to look it up as well. I can get it. What too. the time frame is. Madam Chair, can I ask some other Sure, sure. So the, cur so the current <clears throat> parties that have your party status in Vermont are D's, R's, and P's. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> and I's can never be a major party because they're not a declared party. Being an well, you I can't, be, you, you wouldn't have an I, a party if you're an independent. Okay. Okay. So then, th then what I's have is the same as what minor party candidates have? Or minor party candidates also get something different, consideration-wise. Minor parties do it on Thursday before the election, before the primary. Independents do it on Friday before the primary. And major parties do it the week after. So it's kind of a benefit of being a major party, which is a sought-after oh. designation and was when there were, you know, when a minor party wants to go to a major party, that's a benefit you have of being a major party. Yes. Yes. Um, so I, I mean, I, if, if, um, if there isn't support here, I'm not going to pursue this just as it, as the others. Um, I, I know that this is, and I, I actually, um, <laughs> one of my worst experiences on the floor was when we actually came to this, uh, this compromise, because it used to be that it used to be that independents declared after the primary. Then it was moved so that they had to declare at the same time the major party candidates declared. Right. Right. And we, that, we took a lot of testimony on that. And I, I firmly believe that's unconstitutional because they're not running for the, in the primary. So the compromise was to the Friday before. And um, I dreamt that I, reported it on the floor and was so upset about the compromise that then I went in the cloakroom and threw up. <laughs> oh. Charming. I don't think I, I can ever go through the cloakroom again. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so if there, unless there, unless others want to pursue this, I'm just going to drop it because I don't think there's any support for it, even though I firmly believe I'm right. So well, that's what we, we love about you. That's what we love about you, Jeanette White. You always firmly believe you're right. And then no, no, no. 
every once in a while, every once in a while, though, you, you know, you do the big switcheroony. And, and, and we live for those moments. Brian and I live for those moments. <laughs> I, I do think I'm right here, but I'm not going to pursue it if there's not the will to do it, because I don't think it would make it through the house anyway. I mean, I'm just going to ask clarifying, aka dumb questions until I understand things. So you might have been able to convince me. I just am learning as I go about some of these really nuanced positions and when they've changed and, you know, who's, who's affected, right? I think there's partially clerks are affected, but in many ways it's, it's candidates and why they would choose to run. And I don't have enough background in how this has tripped people up recently. I think the impetus for changing it was that um, it's the sore loser issue and people really felt strongly. And there were a few in the house that year that were sore losers and ran as independents. And um, I don't think that's a valid concern, but obviously a lot of people do, so. So Senator Collimore. Yeah, I, I guess I'm okay with what we have now. Okay. I understand Senator Clarkson's point about using resources of the uh, major parties, but I also I also understand your position too, but I don't think I I feel it strongly enough to change what's current. As Carol said, I'm not gonna fall on the sword for this one. You did say that. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Polina. I would leave it the way it is. I mean, I, I, I have mixed feelings about it, but I, I also have had the experience where I've been asked to endorse people who you would characterize as sore losers, you know, people who lost the primary but said they wanted to keep running anyway. And would I support them, you know, personally? And and I've said no, because I don't, I'm not a big fan of the sore loser aspect of things. But on the, on the other hand, I think announcing an independent after the primary would be okay. I, so I'm really have mixed feelings about it. I think we'll drop it. Yep. Okay. So um, the next one is the ability to only run on one party in the general election. Not be able to run as a DP or an RD or a DR. Well, that's kind of silly. Well, it was, <laughs> it was a suggestion that came up, so it's here. No, I know, I'm kidding. <laughs> Anybody have any feelings about that? I mean, I don't even think it made our list, but I honestly care more when people run for like multiple positions than I do that they run under different parties. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. true. Well, let's just, unless there's um, willingness to go ahead. I, I put everything on the list, I'm telling you that, and this came from somebody. So I put it on the list. Senator Clarkson, do you have your hand up? I do, I do. Okay. Uh, so th this is slightly different from the issue, the, the primary issue. We're gonna talk about candidates running in the primary and then yes. switching parties. It, that's, you have that listed under primaries. I have that listed next. Ah, okay. Because I, so, I do care about but let's, that. But let's, let's um, either do away with this or have more conversation first on running a, in only one party. Do away with it, with the suggestion. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Good. So then the next one was um, the ability to run in the, that if you choose to run as your primary party as a D in the primary, then you shouldn't be able to switch and run as your primary party as an R in the general, even though you got both nominations. And I suspect this is more an issue for the, for R's and D's, but for D's and P's. So Bruce, you had that on your list also, I remember. Do you wanna? Yes, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the Democratic Party, Vermont Democratic Party, we think this is an important issue. Just as I think I indicated last week, it it's, goes to like truth in advertising. You know, what is a person standing for? And ultimately we were asking the question, is there a difference between the parties? And if there is, a, if there is some type of difference between the parties, and if somebody runs in party A, then th and they win the primary in party A's primary, then they should run in that same party in the general election. Now, if they wanna be an A slash B slash C, 
we don't have a problem with that. That's fine. They can have uh, multiple party endorsements, but their principal party should be consistent between the primary and the general election. We've had a lot of complaints about people switching. You know, I thought I voted for, for instance, I thought I voted for a Democrat, and now they now it looks like that person is running on a different party. Um, so we just want to maintain that consistency, that truth in the, in the advertising, and it, you know, an indication that the parties actually stand for something different. If, particularly you know, if they're a major party, you know, they should people should be recognizing that and running in the principles of that party. So I'm going to ask Will, before we um, have more conversation on that, I'm going to ask Will, um, after the election, I mean, after the primary, then you get, the candidate gets their, their nominating papers or whatever that, those are called their, whatever, and then they choose which party they want first. Isn't that the way the statute reads? They choose. And if they don't choose, then you choose for them. And you do it alphabetically or some. No, we don't choose there. That's also laid out in the statute. Okay. If they don't tell us it goes the way you would probably expect, which is the one you were nominated for by primary, then any okay. committee nomination. Okay. But they. I think but we actually said just choose. the example you gave too, it would be any where you were the named candidate and nominated by that party primary. Then if you got written in on another major party, that would be second. And then any committee nomination would be third. Then that, but you can't, yeah. um, you can't be a written on two primary ballots? No. Okay, I just need to remind myself of that. Okay. Yep. You can't run on two, in two primaries, right. yeah. I would just note though too, um, we talked a lot about deadlines, but the major party nominations, I would have to look back, but. There's a wide range. So like most of the party nominations that we get from major parties come in during the summer sometime. So they'll be running in the party primary of one party. And then we get a party nomination from another party for that same person that sits on file in our office until the time they have to, after the primary, tell us what order they want those to go in. I mean, I just think that if a person, um, is endorsed by like, wins the support of two parties. That means that to both of those parties were supporting that person, um, knowing that the person had the option of how they declare themselves, with how they name themselves. And I think it should be up to the candidates to decide. I mean, they got support from both. I mean, both parties trusted this person enough to, to support them, whether it's winning a primary or winning a nomination, whatever it might be. I don't see why we wouldn't let the person decide for themselves which how they wanted to be listed. And I think, you know, the reality is that, the, the, you know, these days, the way, where things are at, I mean, by running in the Democratic primary, for example, you get to actually spread your message to more people and get seen by more people, which then gives more people the opportunity to decide if they support you or not. So I think that it's, you know, if, and then, you know, there wouldn't be as much competition in a progressive primary. So it actually is more beneficial to the process to allow people to run and to get the support of both parties and then make a decision for themselves as to which to order they want them to be in. And frankly, I don't think for the voters, I could be wrong, but I don't think voters really care that much to tell you the truth. I mean, party people care about this stuff, but I mean, I've run under both parties and I don't think I've ever had anybody question me or ask me about why I did one or the other, or, or you know, I don't think anybody ever decided based on that, the order of the parties. I think voters vote for a person and they don't really look at whether it's got a D or a P or an R, they vote for who they support. Senator Clarkson. Um, I don't agree with Anthony. I, I think parties put a lot of resources into uh, their primary candidates uh, and, uh, and and they open up, uh, it, uh, primary candidates get access to stuff that they wouldn't get if they were necessarily in another party. And to not have to, if you win that primary, to not have to uh, uh, take that win, uh, it's, it, and use it as the first letter of what you run as is really to me um, you have been untruthful to the to the 
to the voters. I mean, when you go back to the voters, you've said, I am, I, I care enough to run in uh, the Democratic primary. I care enough to be a candidate in the Democratic primary. And, uh, and that's where your name is printed. And that's, you again, you own that candidacy to then uh, turn around after the primary and say, well, really, I want to be a PD. You know, that's not what the voters voted for. I mean, they, you may have been written in in something else, but you ran with an intentionality of being a Democrat. And I think you need to own that. And I think that you need that needs to be consistent with whatever you just whatever letters you add after that. Fine to add a P afterwards, but the, the, the primary you win should be the primary that you are represented, that should be first represented in the letters that follow your name. I think, you know, too many resources and too much energy, uh, too much is shared with, with, you know, it's just, it's, it's unfair. It just strikes me as unfair and that the party system is being used and, and, and people do care actually, Anthony, I, we've had in uh, close by, we had a race with uh, uh, somebody who switched and, you know, it just didn't feel good. It, and I've had a bunch of voters ask me, what's the difference, you know, why? What, was she, un had something happened that made her unhappy with us? What had we done? Ah, that, you know. That, what, yeah, it just, I have a clarifying question, which is, is there a way for somebody to use the platform and resources of a party and then help advance the major party mm -hmm. status of another party through that win. So I guess I'm curious, like if everybody's running as a Democrat, how do the progressives maintain the major party status in that regard? Is it from the general election, not from the primary? But I'm just trying the, the, to rank Well, here. We, do <laughs> have, we do have a list on here. And I think that to, to be a major party, you have to be organized in 30 towns and you have to okay. have in, in seven counties or more. And we'll also like how many votes you got. Well, I tried to find that in here and I couldn't find it. I thought it was based also on percentage of votes. I did too. Will? Just looking at that um, to make sure I get this right. And it's a good point to raise Senator Rahm. Um, the, to, one of the requirements to be a major party is to have received 5% or more of the vote it, with a candidate for statewide office. So you need a statewide office candidate on the general election ballot that receives 5% or more of the vote. Um, there's also a provision, that's what I was just looking at, <clears throat> that says that if you have a dual nomination, you have to tell our office which of those two parties you want the major part of the vote to go toward. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be the first one listed. In the general election. Correct. So See, just for an yeah. example, right? This year, um, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman ran in the Democratic Party primary, got nominated by the Progressive Party State Committee, informed us that he wanted his uh, parties to appear as PD, on the general election ballot. And so the 5% would be, would go to the P major. Party. Right. So that's what feels like gaming a little bit to me is that you would run in one primary, take advantage of that platform, which Anthony, like you said, is valuable to get your message out there, but then you're springboarding your, your ultimate benefit to the party that you did not run on with the primary and helping their major party status which does right. seem to present a challenge to me. So an option, that's correct. And an option, I am totally agnostic about this, would be a requirement that the party in which you ran as the primary candidate, right? So if you ran in the primary for the Democratic Party, that that has to be listed first. Right. And that that's the one that the, your vote totals for statewide office will go toward the major party consideration for. Right. I mean, and, I'm a little more agnostic about which one you put first, just, I mean, and maybe it has to be this right. way. That's not my concern. I don't, if someone wants to say P first, that's fine. But if they're running in the Democratic primary, that I believe is the party that should benefit from their general election, um, major party sort of vote count. That would be an option. That would be an part. option too. You're right. Regardless of the way you order them, we're going to look at the party in which you ran in the primary for that calculation. Right. Yeah. 
Oh, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Just want to, I, I'm sorry. I understand and, what you said there. You're saying oh, somebody will or, or Keisha said that you could run in as you could decide which you want, which order you want the letters to go in. Yes. But the five percent rule would relate to the yes. one that you were in the primary on. Right. I think with the letters, you're saying this is who I plan to caucus with. So you're giving the voter information about where you plan to put your allegiances once you get there but you should not be able to advance the major party status of the party for which you did not run in their primary. Right, which is, I said less articulately than you, but which is why I feel that if you run in one party, in one party's primary, you are should be obligated to run with that party first in your letter designation going forward in the general election. I guess I'm just, I'm personally, Allison, we may slightly disagree, but I'm less concerned that I want to give the candidate agency, but I don't think the party should benefit that didn't give them the platform well, in the primary. That, yeah. That's my, that's my oh, same point. Oh, okay. No, okay. well, she, I don't, she, yeah, go ahead. I think Keisha is saying that you can choose whichever one you want first, but you shouldn't, the, the prime, the, where, the party should not receive major party status based on your running in a different party. If you run as a Democrat and you get um, more than more than five percent of the vote, the statewide vote, and then you decide that you're going to become a PD instead of a DP, then you right now your vote total, your percentage of the vote is given to the Progressive Party, and right. that means that maintains them as a major party. And Keisha's point is that regardless of how you put your letters, that you shouldn't profit the party it's, that... Yeah. Right. I, I understand. You end up in the same place. I mean, we may have different reasons. I mean, I, I support that. But, but I mean, you don't end, end up, up in, in the, the same, same place. place, which is it, no. if you, you're, you shouldn't be allowed to take advantage. You should benefit the party that you wrote uh, ran on in the primary should yeah. benefit should benefit uh, with those vote totals in yes. the general election. Yes, regardless yes, of how you sense. how you order it. I I, I could care less <laughs> about the yeah. order. Regardless, yeah, but the, the order. order has impact on. The it vote doesn't have to. It doesn't we we can change that. It doesn't have to be the order that that assigns the um, percentage of the votes. That's what Keisha's saying, and right, saying. and Keisha's saying that. But but so the no matter which order it was put in, that the demo, that the whoever you ran in the primary would get the benefit of the of the tally, the benefit yes. of the vote. I, I I get that, and I guess I would say that I think it's that I would go one step further and say that if you have benefited that fully from a primary with a a, a party, you should st it, it, you should have that. Uh, party be first on, in your letter accumulations in all your degrees that you list after your name. Bruce. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to um, kind of in indicate that we heard the like from a lot of voters in the last election that they do care about what the primary party affiliation is. Uh, to say that they don't care, I, I think is not accurate. I mean, I mean, it may not be with every voter, but we heard from a lot of voters that they were upset about that somebody could change their party affiliation, primary party affiliation between the primary and the general election. And they just did not feel that was fair. And, you know, it's something disingenuous. Again, do the parties mean anything? That's what we're really getting to. If the parties mean something, then you should consist, be consistent in your party affiliation from the primary through the general election. Agreed. Anybody else want to weigh in on this one? Senator Colomore? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm glad I had a chance to listen to all the uh, discussion because this was a really good discussion. Uh, and every, it's kind of like in my mind, everybody's right. So I understand what Senator Polina said and I agree with him. And I go back to John Odom's thing about when I go into a booth, to vote, I'll make this distinction. I think it's it's different for a statewide candidate versus a local candidate. 
I think there's much more of a tendency on the local level for someone to vote for someone they know and not be as concerned about their party affiliation. Um, I don't think that's as true in a statewide race as it might be on a local level, but you know, board of aldermen, a mayor, even our elections for the general assembly, depending on the size that you're talking about, a very small house district, for instance, I think people know who you are and I don't think it, it reaches the same level of importance what party you, you belong to. So I take Anthony's point about people vote for the, for the name. The name recognition is what we all began with. Um, but I also feel strongly that Senator Clarkson and Rahmer are making good points and, and Bruce as well, that if you've chosen to run as a whatever and you won, I think you do have a responsibility to stay that way uh, for the general election. So there you go. All right, so um, where are we here now? We have two suggestions, I believe, or we have three, leave it the way it is. Um, change so that if you, whichever party um, you, in which you ran in the primary, and if you win, and even if you get uh, write-ins or nominations from another party, you have to use that that one as your first your first identifying letter. And then the third um, option is let the candidate choose which they want to put behind their name in which order. And um, but uh, make sure that the votes that are cast are assigned to the party in which they ran as a in the primary. So it seems to me those are kind of the three options that we have. Um, and where do do it, it, anybody else out there have any um, feelings on this? Uh, John, Carol, Pat, Audrey, who else is with us? Oh, I see Chris Winters is with us. And um, John? Well, since you asked, it's not I really did a ask. first thing. <laughs> but um, as someone uh, who before my clerk life was a uh, multi-time uh, Democratic county clerk, uh, Democratic staffer, and there was a conversation about the resources and Senator White, I think I was the one who provided you with your lists when you first ran it. <laughs> Thank you. A crazy program I wrote that anyways, um, I, you know, I, th I think there's a couple arguments here. The one about where the 5% goes to is really administrative <laughs> and it's yeah. just sort of a, a practical conversation. The, the PRD thing and Senator Polina will probably get a kick out of this because I, when I was a blogger, I was ruthless bugging him about uh, running as a D and getting a D on there, but Quite honestly, in my experience, that's not an administrative question. And it has always been a question about members of different parties feeling that it's icky. Um, and I don't think ickiness is, is a really, I mean, I think I, I agree with Senator Rahm and Senator Polina. I don't know that, that intra-party icky feelings are probably a good basis on which to, to change something. So that would be my feeling. Is that a technical election term? Icky. <laughs> it's a technical everything term. Okay. Well, I, well I, I don't know how much longer we want to talk about this, but I mean, obviously I appreciate John's thoughts. Um, I don't like the idea that people are saying that you, you're benefiting the party by running in their primary, therefore you owe them something necessarily. I don't think that's quite accurate. I think... I would look at it as somebody who's appealing to two parties and gets the support of both of those parties that because those voters trust that person. And I think those voters trust that person enough that they would allow that person to make a decision as to whether they want to, you know, their, to go out as a PD or a DP or whatever it is, regardless of where the, where the percentages fall. I think that it goes back to 
question of um, letting the voters really have, having the votes and the voters really have meaning. And if they're voting for a person, they're not voting for a party. You know, a lot of people will say, well, traditionally, you know, my father, my grandfather, we all voted for Republicans, whatever. So I just vote for party line. But I think in Vermont, people vote for the person more than they're voting for the party. And I think if someone gets endorsed by two parties, they, those people are trusting that person to make a decision as to how they want to appear on the general election ballot and where they want their vote totals to go. I think I'm it's, gonna, uh, I'm sorry. Go no, no. I, no, I'm done. I, I may end up be going the Collimore method on this one, I don't know. I'm gonna throw in a thought here that I think it, you're right in um, local elections and in house elections and probably even in Senate elections. In statewide elections, I'm not so sure that people had, most people had any idea who Beth Pierce was or Carolyn um, um, Brannigan. Brannigan. Right. I, I, I don't think people at the statewide level know who those people are. Who, who, knew, who knows who Doug Hoffer is? I mean, but anyway, so I'm going to um, ask for um, some opinion here on the, should we leave it alone? Yes. Yes. If you're asking for a vote. I'm just asking for to get a, a sense of where we are. Should we leave it alone? Or sh are there, then there are two other options. Um, so, Senator Rahm? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of attached to my administrative change because it doesn't feel very major party to use another major party's primary and then switch your party affiliation in the general. So you're talking about the, the percentage of the votes? Yes, as John called it, administrative. administrative. I'm happy to call it. <laughs> Senator Clarkson, do you want to leave oh, it alone? I've been pretty, I've been pretty clear. I, I, I actually feel pretty strongly about this. Okay, I, so I think that if you run- No, no, no just you, tell me if yeah. you want to leave it alone or not. That's all we're nope, doing right now. I do not want to leave it alone. Okay, great. And neither do I. So we have three people who don't want to leave it alone. Now, the next question then, is let's look at the question of the administrative issue and how that, and that does, in my mind, make a huge difference that you shouldn't run in the re Republican, and I'm gonna use Republicans here because we use DPs all the time and that's the case here, but you shouldn't run in the Republican primary, get 80% of the, or whatever, and then decide that you're going to really be a Tea Party person and assign those votes to that party in order to make them qualify as a major party. That in my mind is, is, re is totally wrong. So where are we with that? Because they don't necessarily go together, the order or the this. So where are we with that? Senator Polina? I don't like it. You don't like what? What you outlined. You mean that you can change, you can use your votes to the benefit of the other party to qualify them as a major party? Wait, I'm not sure. Ask the question again. I'm confused okay. by the question. So here's, here's I, mean, I know the two things we're talking about. I'm just not sure which one we're talking about right now. What we're talking about right now is, should people be allowed to run in the Democratic primary right. and then decide that they want, and then decide that they want, or yeah, I'll, I'll use Democrats and progressives because those are the parties that we have, run in the Democratic party, get over 5% of the vote, then switch um, in the general election to, to um, the progressive party and use that percentage of the votes that they got in the Demo democratic race to qualify the progressive party to be a, a major party. Well, they would have, um, they would have been endorsed by both parties and chose to put the progressive party, put the P first and the D second. Right, I mean, that's, that's a different question of yeah, which they put first or second. One, what? We already lost that one, Anthony. 
Well, I'm really not sure which no, one I'm not sure you not... did. Okay. Will, can you the way it is, you the way it is today? This? Will you ask the question, Will? Ask the question. Yeah, I want to. I want to see where the five committee members are on this issue of being able to assign your vote percentages to the party in which you did not run in the primary. You can do that right now. I know, right? and I. So, would you explain that so that we can? that all five of us understand that and we can get a read on it. Well, so somebody can <laughs> run in the Democratic primary for a statewide office, get that, win that primary, also be nominated by another political party, including a minor party. Mm -hmm. We have a few of in Vermont on and off. Libertarians almost always organize in Liberty Union. Um, mm -hmm. Here's... So sorry to throw that curveball, but by any any organized party, which includes minor parties, can then also nominate you just through the party committee process, right? And say we want you to be our gubernatorial candidate on the general election ballot. Then it's up to that candidate under current law to decide both things, the order of the names and which of those parties that are going to appear on the general election ballot will benefit from, so which one we look at when we say, did the party that nominated him by committee have a candidate that got 5% in the general election? They tell us which party to apply that 5% to and to, to determine the major party status of that party going forward. What's interesting is the, the current law sets it up kind of the opposite of what you guys are talking about, where it says, you tell us which party to apply that 5% to and that party has to be listed first. That's how the current law is written. So it, it's it's saying what Senator Clarkson kind of wants wants to be the case also that, but it allows them, the difference with, from Senator Clarkson is it allows them to choose that one, but then it says you have to list that first, but you could choose the one that's not the primary winner. You guys are talking about whether we wanna say you the 5% has to be applied to the party of which you win the primary. Yes, and that's the question. Separate question. Do we care whether you then list that first, second, right. third? And I, I want to separate the and, listing. And the other thing, right. And the other thing I want to say, I, I don't agree that that's an administrative um, decision. That's a really sort of fundamental decision to the viability of major parties going forward. I can, that's an easy administrative thing for us to do. You just tell us which party to, to choose to look at, you know? Right. Um, and in that, on that note, I just want the committee to remember that what major party status means is that we, the state, have to run a primary yeah. for the party. And that means we have to produce the same amount of ballots for that party as we do for the for any other major party. We because we have to be ready to send all three in this the current case ballots to every voter who requests them. You always need to assume that everybody might request any ballot. Um, so it's a pretty large expense for the state in ballot printing costs um, to, to operate these primaries. And so it we will could... be more so if we're talking about a lot of mailing of ballots back and forth. We, we could actually, um, somebody, we, we could end up with a number of major parties if people can assign um, the, the vote counts to any party they want. I mean, in, where they were um, yeah, nominated. Yeah. If they were nominated by Liberty Union Party, they could assign the vote. At, at one point, wasn't the Liberty Union Party a major party? I believe I before so. my time, maybe for a cycle. Yeah, yeah they, they were for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, okay, so where are most, we? Most, with... most democracies would appreciate having made multiple parties. Well, I seem to remember one of our statewide officers once ran with, this is a slightly different question, but ran with six party names behind his, his name on the ballot. That's right. And I won't say who it was, but... Um, so where are we with this question of assigning the um, the vote counts? Does any before I go to the committee's 
um, the committee for um, weigh in. Does anybody else out there have any feeling about this? Gwen, Pat, Carol, Audrey, um, Chris Winters. No, I guess not. I didn't see any hands or any unmutes. So, okay, so where are we with, with that? Senator Clarkson, this is not how you put the, the order in which you put it behind your name. We're gonna ask that I question later. I am clear on that. We're voting on the 5% rule. Yep. And I and think that, if, if, that the 5% should follow the primary win. Okay. Senator Rahm. I agree with that. Senator Colomar. I agree. Senator Polina. Wait a second. Did we just lose? My battery just went dead. I just plugged in. Oh. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I can't see anything. I mean, we I'm can't see being... you either. We Wait can't see you, but we can hear you. All right, there now I am. I'm can... back. Sorry, my, we my battery went dead. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to state the question again. I think that it's up to the candidate to decide where they want the 5% to the percent to go. Okay, I don't know if that's so... a short, shorthand way of saying it. That, that, that is your answer, yes. I agree with, um, I think that it should go with the um, party in which they ran in the primary. So we have four here. Um, so we can get that written up. Now let's talk about the order of behind their name. Senator Clarkson. Well, you, everybody knows how I feel. Yeah, okay. Senator I, I feel that, you know, just like the 5%, first place should go uh, first position. I don't know what, how we want to refer to it, but yep. if you uh, uh, win in a, a primary, you have to translate that win not only to the 5%, the 5% follows the primary win, so should the placement of the, the party letter. Okay. Senator Colomar? Oh, boy. I thought we were all done with this. Um, I know. I'm sorry. Well, I, he's thinking, can I ask a clear? Oh, sorry. I thought you were thinking. No, it's getting, it's getting clearer. Okay, yes. Okay. Clarifying Allison, question. Allison has convinced me. I will, I will agree with her on this. Do you, ha do you have to keep the, the party, even if it's not first? No. I mean, okay, so let, let's say the Republicans, you know, wrote you in. But you you don't just don't want that label. Right. You don't have to keep it. No. No, you you you. I have been um, uh, written in two or three times Republicans down here because we don't have a lot of Republicans down here, and so um, they've written me in, and I did not accept the nomination just because I felt there were it's a difference in um, basic platforms in the parties, so I couldn't. I couldn't run as both, but you don't have to accept it. Yes. I, I see this as, as an issue more of a, a candidate's, I mean, it's such an intimate decision on how you want to put yourself out there and what values that, you know, sort of shares about who you are and which who you're going to caucus with. So I think of this as very separate and I would want to continue to allow candidates to put the party affiliations in whatever order they choose. Senator Polina. I would agree with Keisha, what she just said. I think it's up to the candidates to decide what order they want to put their party party names on. I, I think we're basically changing something or we're, we're fixing something that isn't broken. I think it's, you know, the ideal thing would be to leave it alone, but obviously that's not happening. Okay, so my vote is I think uh, there are many, many people in the state who think it's broken. It, um, there are many people who don't think it's broken, but I don't think that voters have any idea when they vote for somebody that the candidate can then choose whether they put the P or the D or the R or the D first. I think voters don't know that. They just vote for 
a candidate. So I um, am going to vote with Collimore and Clarkson here. Okay. It is. Um, it's almost at 430. Yeah. There's one more issue that I'd like to just, I think we can get rid of it on our list right within three minutes. There, there was a suggestion that there ought to be a penalty for candidates who open the ballot box early. And I looked up the penalties and I believe there is a $200 fine. So I'm not sure why this was an issue. Does anybody wish to speak to this? Well, I think it happened, if I'm remembering the incident in Rutland County. Um, but I, I don't really have anything to say about it. Senator Clarkson? So, can, can I just clarify, how does a candidate even have access to the ballot box? I mean, isn't it the clerks? I mean, what are the candidates doing in there anyway? Maybe Will can help us. I, I believe the BCA was, or some members of it were asked to open sealed ballots or the bag to see whether there was a particular number of votes for a particular party. Again, without, without knowing more about it, I, it was an issue in Rutland County, I know that. And it was a, a house race, I believe. Or no, I'm not sure it was a house race. Do you remember, Will, what, what this is about? Without using names, maybe you can just help us understand the, the issue. Sure, and I do, and I'll really try to keep it quick since I know we're at the end here. Um, yes, the, a ballot bag after the election was opened. And oh, the, that's different. Yeah. The reason it was, was, um, but it was, it was um, you know, and I wasn't there. I've heard what I've heard via emails and everything else. Um, it was opened because the name, it's interesting how these issues we've discussed today all tie together in this story. The names of writing candidates had not been recorded. And as you know, there was, um, why this loops in another aspect of what we've just been talking about, a writing campaign in the progressive primary for governor. Um, and so they were trying to see who, what name had been written in on progressive ballots that were cast in this town. They immediately recognized the mistake they'd made and that they overstepped their authority. I wanna tell everybody that the BCA chair called me within an hour of realizing the mistake they'd made. They didn't look at the ballots, they sealed the bag back up, but there was a candidate present. The results weren't changed at all. The ORV was not amended. There was a candidate present and it rightfully caused a lot of concern to voters in that um, area who heard that a ballot bag had been opened without the right authority. There's statute that gives me two reasons why I can authorize a town to open a bag and then otherwise you have to go to court and get a court order. And the reason they were looking was neither of the ones I can authorize, um, which are if you seal your memory card in the bag by accident. Um, so again, mistake was realized, but that's where it comes from. But Senator White, I think you're right. There are penalties in place for any kind of nefarious action taken with ballots. Yeah, I think there's very clearly one about the ballot bags. And, and like I said, there's also ballot. the statute in place yeah. already about, you're right, yeah. about the ballot bag, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, with that, I think that maybe we'll call it a day, should we? I think we need to go outside and catch the last piece of sunshine before. I know. And so we are going to next week uh, again on Wednesday so that we have um, kind of the full day start then with um, we have the two candidate issues that uh, the requirement to vote and the uh, limit the number of candidates for JP by each party that they can nominate and then we'll move to um, primaries the issue there and the general election and um, if we get there, we'll also move to, um, I'm hoping that we can move to um, the issue of mail out for the general election. And I, I, I'm thinking that all of these issues are 
um, really related to elections and that there's two issues here around campaign finance. And we might think about putting them in a different bill because they're related specifically to campaign finance. And the only other issue that has come up that we might want to think about putting in here is the um, report of the reapportionment board. Their report has, is supposed to be to us by July of next summer. They aren't even going to get the census information until July. So we need to move that date for them. And there's really no good place to put it. And I don't know that it deserves a standalone bill. But that's the only other thing I've thought of it that sh should probably be in here. Any other thoughts? It really sounds like it might be later than July too. Could be August or September. Yeah, the, so what I think we need to do is we need to, I um, wrote to Tom Little and asked him what a, 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 a safe date would be to put into the statute so that they can meet it. He's the one to ask for sure. Yeah. Yep. I'm just curious, Madam Chair, when, yeah. was there a recent time when the committee discussed putting yourself on multiple places on the ballot? That, Doing we work. haven't discussed that yet, but it's it a good be running for more than one office. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that wasn't ever listed as an issue, I don't think. But not this year, no. But has it come up in in recent testimony and past? Yeah. Areas? Yes. And if, and if we want to ago. talk about it, two years ago, and it was just sort of left alone. Was it just? Well, I think that I think the main decision was that. Um, it would be unconstitutional to limit anybody's right to run on any, That's and even to, okay. even to run for um, incompatible offices. It says in the constitution that you have the right to run for any office you want, but if elected to two incompatible offices, you can't serve in both. And you choose. Yeah. Okay. And that, that leaves somebody has to be appointed then. So if you yeah, ran in seven different offices and won one of them um, and accepted it, you'd have six other offices to have be appointed. Okay. Right, right. But the constitution, I, I think it's clear that the constitution says you can run for anything you want to. That's helpful. But we can, we can bring it up again if, if there's concerns about it now. We did change it so that you have to have a separate uh, petition for each office you're running for <laughs> instead of <laughs> I, uh, a friend of mine ran against me. He's in the, I don't remember which party he's in one of those minor parties and he runs all the time. And he, uh, he was at the co-op once with his petitions and it said for state Senator. And I said, Ben, don't you want me to be elected? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, you're running against me. And he said, oh, okay. And he crossed it off and put U.S. Senate. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So we'll see you tomorrow, committee. On, on that amusing note.